Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Old Fort Niagara. I'm Robert Emerson. I'm the executive director of Old Fort Niagara. And today we're going to talk about the art and science of fortification, how it developed in Europe, how it got transplanted to North America, and how it was uh, used here at Old Fort Niagara. We have several examples of um, existing structures that were influenced uh, not only by European antecedents, but also uh, here in North America as well. So um, without further ado, let's go to the slides. All right. So we're really going to talk about legacies of the Ancien Regime, uh, because uh, the structures we're going to talk about today are really uh, originally built by the French, um, who were regarded as the masters of military engineering at this time. Uh, so um, we're going to look at the French castle, uh, the powder magazine, the outer works, and the Dauphin Battery, uh, all built during the 18th century. So let's start with the European background, uh, the art and science of military engineering. This is a really interesting painting of, um, of a siege. It's the siege of Philipsburg during uh, one of the Louis XIV's wars. Um, this specifically occurred in 1676. And if you look at this image, you can see uh, off in the background is the fortified town uh, or the fortress of Philipsburg. It was on the east bank of the Rhine River. And um, it was held by the French, which gave the French a toehold east of the Rhine into what's now Germany. And in the foreground, you can really see the Imperial troops uh, digging siege trenches toward the fortress. They're trying to get their artillery closer and closer to uh, create a breach in the fortress wall. So this was done uh, routinely time after time after time during the 17th and 18th centuries. Before this system developed, the system of defense in depth, which we saw here uh, at uh, Phillipsburg, uh, the medieval castle was uh, the best form of defense. And the secret to the medieval castle's uh, defensibility was height. Um, you're, dealing with, um, you're dealing with edged weapons here. You're dealing with uh, trebuchets, uh, you know, which throw large boulders. Uh, but you're not dealing with artillery yet. So height is really an advantage because your enemy has to either climb the walls uh, or force their way through an entrance of some kind. So the higher the towers, the higher the walls, the more defensible the position is. That all changes in the 15th century with the introduction of gunpowder and artillery. You know, siege artillery begins to be pretty common uh, at, in the 1400s. So of course, fortress designers uh, rethink what the best uh, form of defense is. And in Renaissance Italy, um, this is really where the, the, uh, the birthplace of, of this system of fortification in depth uh, is uh, developed. It's, uh, the system is known as the Italian trace. Here we see a couple of examples of, uh, of these early uh, fortresses. In fact, uh, names that you would recognize dabbled in fortification, uh, people like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, and Galileo all dabbled in fortification. And, and this system with modifications was in use pretty much for 300 years. What it all comes down to is defense in depth. Uh, you're no longer going to have these really high walls because artillery uh, can shoot right through, blow them down pretty easily. So you're going to start having layer upon layer upon layer of fortifications. You can see here um, off to the right, there is a, actually a, a cutaway view showing the, the layers of defense in what would be considered a modern fortification at that time. You have the glossy, 
you have a covered way, you have ditches, um, a tenet, and then your main walls. Uh, the other key to this was really uh, the bastion. So the bastion is uh, sort of an arrowhead shaped structure and it allows you to do a couple of things. First of all, there are no dead zones anywhere on the fortification. There's no place that an enemy can take shelter and not be exposed to fire from at least, at least one side and in most cases more than one side. So bastions also promote the idea of flanking fire, creating a crossfire that attacking troops will be caught in, it really makes uh, the approaches to the fort a killing field. So th th these bastion forts um, help the defenders defend the fort and make it more difficult for attackers to approach. So um, we're gonna talk about probably the, the most famous of the French engineers, Sebastien Le Presta de Vauban. And he lived um, during, he made his, most of his career during the 17th century. He came from Burgundy and he was from the lesser nobility there. He was educated in mathematics, uh, geometry, and drafting by the village priest. Then uh, he went to a Carmelite college from age 10 to 17. He joined the army, uh, served in the cavalry, and in, in the 1650s, Vauban rose to prominence, making surveys of various forts around France. During the War of the Devolution, this was from 1667 to 68, he really took the lead in fortress building on the Belgian frontier, um, which of course that was the Spanish Netherlands. He developed scientific methods of siege warfare. He perfected indirect fire and covering his men from danger. He was very concerned about the men who were working in the trenches and he did everything he could to protect them from enemy fire. He organized, elevated, and professionalized the Corps of Engineers in France, created a central bureaucracy to serve the Corps. He even, um, he wanted entrance exams and several years of practical experience for engineers. Up until this point, uh, engineering was kind of a learn on the job uh, training sort of uh, situation. He wanted also to impose standard practices and procedures. He took pride in his ability to predict the exact duration of the siege based on scientific analysis. Now Vauban was made Marshal of France after a distinguished career in 1703. He built 160 forts and conducted 48 sieges of enemy forts and these sieges were all successful. Now later in life, uh, in the early years of the 18th century, he took a real interest in social reforms. Um, he was looking at the plight of poor people in France and advocating, uh, advocating aid for them, and so he fell into disfavor at court. Uh, so he ended his life um, uh, probably less, uh, less prominent than he was earlier in his career. But his name among uh, military historians is very, uh, very common today. But a lot of people misunderstand what Vauban did. He did not invent uh, the system of defense in depth. He did not invent the bastion. He simply perfected those concepts. Now, um, we're going to go to a little bit of a map. Um, in the, the defense of France, in the age of Louis XIV, that would be in the 17th century and in very early 18th century. You can see here that um, there are fortifications all over France and Vauban had to travel all over the country to build forts, to renovate them, and in some cases to even uh, destroy forts that were obsolete or, or taken from the enemy and no longer useful. But the cockpit of war in the 17th century was really Flanders. And that's, uh, of course, north of France. In the 17th century, Spain controlled what's now Belgium. The Dutch were north of the Spanish Netherlands, uh, the Dutch uh, United Provinces. And, and France was at war with both Spain and the Dutch at different times. So this is where a lot of Vauban's work is gonna be concentrated. 
um, in the low countries. This is an area that has very, very, it's flat, it has very, very few natural defenses. So fortifications are really the key, not only to defending France, but uh, allowing uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, places for troops to marshal to actually invade uh, the enemy. What was created in, uh, in Flanders was a concept called the Precaire, which literally translated means square meadow. Uh, some people translate it as dueling field, but um, regardless of how you translate it, what it was was a double line of very elaborate fortifications that ran along the border between France and the Netherlands, the Spanish Netherlands, later the Austrian Netherlands. The interesting thing about military engineering at this time was engineers both um, designed fortifications to resist attack, and they also uh, designed siege tactics to capture some of those very same fortifications. You might look at an engineering manual of the era and the front half is how to, how to build a defensible fort, and the, the back half is talking about how to attack it successfully. One of the outstanding examples of, of one of these border fortifications was Lille. Lille is a sister city of Buffalo, uh, hence I picked this particular image. Vauban was very, very much involved in, um, in rebuilding this um, this fortified town uh, during the 17th century. Uh, he wasn't in, Lille was actually besieged in 1667. Vauban was not in charge of the siege, but he played a really active part in it. And then he, after it was captured, he worked on it from 1668 to 1674, completely remodeled and rebuilt Lille. This project involved 6,000 workmen they built a citadel um, that's pictured there to the left. They built a citadel that covered 90 acres and used 60 million bricks. Now, Lille really set Vauban's reputation in stone. He now becomes a preeminent engineer in the service of Louis XIV. Now, um, we have, um, an, I just think this is a fascinating uh, quote. Um, Vauban's boss, the Chevalier de Clévy, um, he had a lot of trouble with this fellow, but the Minister of War once said, um, and I, I find this fascinating, you may let Monsieur de, uh, Chevalier de Clévy speak um, as he pleases about the things he wishes to. Let him talk, but never carry out any of the things which he says. Good advice. Now, uh, we talked about the basics of European fortification at the time. These concepts are going to get transplanted to the New World. But, uh, of course, we're not dealing with huge armies in the New World like we are in Europe. We're also dealing with uh, some extended supply lines. And we're going to be wanting to use materials that are readily available locally to build these forts. So you're gonna find uh, a lot of forts uh, are gonna have the sort of same bastion concept, but they're gonna be made from logs. And the most common, the most common way to build a, a, a fort in New France was to dig a ditch and sink logs in the ground, point them at the top, but you'll notice the shape of the fort is very, very similar to what we were looking at in Europe, much, much simplified. Uh, some examples of French forts. Here's a stone fort, uh, Fort Chambly. Um, uh, fort St. Frederick. Um, this, uh, this is at Crown Point, New York. The British later built a fort uh, right next to this, uh, this site. Now, Fort St. Frederick was built in the 1730s, and uh, it was pretty unusual because in addition to having the, the bastion wall, which you can see there with the, the bastions, there's a, also a, a, a tall tower uh, 
which sort of harkens back to an earlier style of fortification. Now, uh, a person in, from France who is going to play a pretty big role in fortifying New France is Gaspard Joseph Chaussegro de Lery. De Lery is born in Toulon in 1682. He trained as a military engineer, probably by his father, but he was not admitted to the engineering corps. He had experience in drafting. He served with the army in an engineering capacity. He did take part in the siege of Turin in, um, in 1706. So he had some combat experience. He had some uh, experience in engineering in the field. Um, he later became a captain in the infantry. And in 1716, he sent to Quebec to prepare plans of existing forts in the colony. This led to his appointment as chief engineer in New France. So he worked on fortifications at Quebec and Montreal, he, he, uh, at Fort St. Frederick. He worked on the governor's pavilion at the Chateau Saint-Louis, and he worked on the facade of the Notre Dame Church in Montreal. He repaired the bishop's palace, dockyards, roads, and canals. He wasn't a brilliant architect, but he was a competent military engineer at creating basic utilitarian buildings that were needed uh, for defense. Now we're going to start talking a little bit more about um, how this gets applied to Fort Niagara. These are some pictures of French barracks buildings in uh, the 18th century. You notice that they, they bear a, a resemblance to the French castle, although they're much larger and much more elaborate in France. And here are some of the projects that Chaussegro de Lyrie worked on in North America. Uh, he, he didn't design all these buildings. Sometimes he repaired them. Sometimes he designed a new facade for them. But you can begin to see uh, the general appearance of these structures. Now, we come to the French castle. And the title of the program, House, Chateau, or Castle, well, the French did not call the French castle the French castle. It was known as La Maison à Machicouli. Uh, Machicouli referred to the overhanging dormers that are on the third floor, which we'll talk about in a minute. The French were very anxious to fortify Niagara in the 1720s. They wanted to keep the English out of this region. And they had erected a, um, a bark trading post where Lewiston stands today. Um, but it was insufficient. And so um, in the 1725, they got permission to erect uh, a fort, a much stronger post. The Maison Michicoli was really the brainchild of the Baron de Langer. Um, he laid out the basic um, design for the building. And it would, it would stand, as you can see here on the map at the left, stand at the mouth of Niagara River, right where it enters Lake Ontario, critical choke point on the water uh, routes to the west. So Langer's idea was pretty much to design this to be a utilitarian building that looks like a barracks. Compare that image of the French castle over there on the right to the images of barracks buildings in France, and you see a lot of common uh, architectural features. If you, look at the, um, if you look at the image on the upper right-hand corner, you'll see what the original layout of Fort Niagara was in 1726. It was just the castle, and it had a wooden stockade, again, employing those bastions that we talked about earlier uh, as the first line of defense. Now, the plan of the castle was... Um, also based on European antecedents. You see over there to the left, that's a floor plan of uh, metropolitan French uh, barracks buildings. You can even see the latrines there. Um, and you'll notice that the castle has a similar layout. The only difference is instead of having room upon room of barracks buildings, we have to fit all of the functions 
of this building into, into one structure. So you're going to have um, different rooms than, than just barracks rooms for soldiers. You're going to have uh, guard rooms. Um, you're going to have a trade room where goods are going to be stored, where the agent who runs the trade at the post is going to have his living quarters. Uh, there's even a chapel because uh, the king is very in, uh, intent upon uh, having his soldiers um, attend religious services when possible. Um, then uh, you might recognize this room as the Johnson room if you visit the fort, uh, but in the French era, it was a storeroom um, because navigation closes from November through April. So you gotta have a lot of supplies in store if you're going to, if the garrison is going to survive the winter. So the, what's now the Johnson room was actually two storerooms. You're going to have uh, officer's quarters. This is the, um, the commandant's quarters. You're going to have a boulangerie where bread is baked for the soldiers. They're gonna be cooking the rest of their meals in their barracks rooms, but they're provided with uh, about a pound and a half of bread a day that would be baked by a professional baker in the boulangerie or bakery. So that's really, uh, you had to fit all of those functions into the castle and the French, as we said before, the machicolated house. Now you notice the dormer windows on the third floor. Um, that allowed soldiers to fire down on attackers. And it refers to a medieval term, machicolations, which served a similar purpose. Uh, but that was really the key to the defense of the building. They did not want to alarm the uh, Six Nations, their neighbors, uh, by building a, a big stone fort. Uh, so they put a wooden stockade in, and this castle was really kind of a citadel uh, where the soldiers could retreat to in the, in the event of an attack. So uh, the next step in the development of Fort Niagara the castle is really the only building um, for the first years that the fort is here, but um, they do add buildings in the 1740s. They add a few buildings, but the really massive expansion comes when the French and Indian War breaks out. The French know that the British are coming with uh, artillery, that the, the wooden stockade around the castle is not going to prevent uh, or not going to withstand artillery fire. And so they send, um, they send out a, um, an infantry officer named Pierre Pouchot to really um, expand Fort Niagara and make it defensible against a formal siege with artillery. Now, Pouchot is an interesting guy. He is a roturier, meaning he's a commoner. He's not of noble lineage. Uh, actually, his father is a glove merchant in Grenoble, France. So his advance in the army is going to be somewhat limited because he is not, uh, he does not have a noble title. He's sort of a self-taught engineer. He's really an infantry officer, but he studied uh, the art of Vauban and also a Dutch uh, engineer named Cohorn. But he studied uh, while he's on campaign. One uh, one contemporary said he studied amid the tumult of the camps. So he serves in northern Italy uh, during the 1730s, and in the 1740s he serves in Germany, makes captain in 1745, and um, he comes over to North America at the beginning of the French and Indian War in 1755. One of the uh, most important sieges that Pouchot took part in was the Siege of Tournai in 1745. And um, he really gained a lot of experience in, at this particular siege. Louis XV had invaded Flanders once again in 1744. Um, and the, the, the French general, uh, Marshal Saxe, decided to besiege Tournai because it was a key point on the Scheldt River. It was held by the Dutch. And um, the French wanted it. So the siege that they um, imposed on 
on uh, Tournai lasted 47 days of a long, pretty long siege. But in the end, the Dutch garrison was forced to capitulate. Uh, a relief force uh, led by the Duke of Cumberland was defeated at Fontenoy nearby. And so the French captured the uh, captured Tournai, and Pouchot was right in the thick of it. So he had some, some combat experience in Europe before coming to North America. One of the buildings that he uh, built here was the Powder Magazine, which still stands, 1757. You can see on the right some uh, images of Powder Magazines in France, and you'll notice the similarity to the powder magazine here at Fort Niagara. Uh, one of the things that powder magazines did not have was a lot of windows. Uh, they had very, very thick, stout walls. You, you didn't want an incoming artillery shell to penetrate your powder magazine, or you, you would be uh, looking at a great big crater where the fort used to stand. Now that powder magazine, in addition to supplying Fort Niagara, also had to supply a lot of the upper posts in the Great Lakes, they're shown there in the blue on the map. And also they had to supply uh, French outposts on the Ohio River uh, down into where Western Pennsylvania is today. Um, Pouchot begins to fortify the fort, building uh, thick earthen walls that will withstand artillery. He starts this in 1755. And this, as this progresses, you can see here several maps showing the course of the construction and an aerial view of what it looks like today. So um, the French lines, even though the outer works have changed much over the years, they're, they're still located on the basic lines that the French installed them during the French and Indian War. And here's just some views. You'll notice um, there's a series of um, man-made hills and ditches, uh, these, these do a couple of things. Uh, they shelter the garrison. Uh, the garrison can fire at attackers from concealed positions. Um, they're also uh, geometrically laid out pretty precisely to deflect enemy fire. And you also wanna channel enemy troops into, um, into places where they can be caught in a crossfire. So this was a very, very precise science. Last thing, uh, the Dauphin Battery, which uh, guarded the Gate of Five Nations and also pointed up the Niagara River. It was named after the heir apparent to the French throne, who's pictured there. Uh, today, the, the battery mounts five working cannons, um, which we fire off during special events. The battery was armed in an interesting way. Um, the first guns that were put in the, this battery came from General Braddock's army. They were captured by the French when Braddock was defeated at the Monongahela. They were later taken away and other captured guns from Oswego, Fort Oswego, were brought to the battery and, and installed, uh, as well as some, some French guns uh, too. So you can come today and see Five guns, two 12-pounders, three 6-pounders on that battery. So the French um, defend Fort Niagara for 19 days during the siege of 1759, but eventually they are forced to uh, surrender the post and the British take over, ending the French regime. So we've gone over... Um, some buildings here at Fort Niagara that, that really trace their antecedents to European practice that starts all the way back in the Renaissance. So thank you very much. And we have just a couple of minutes for questions. We're running out of time. Okay, here's a question. Did the French install the brick on the, the fort's walls? And the answer to that is no. The, uh, the, when the French were here, the walls were made just of earth. And of course that erodes. So it took until the Americans installed the brick in the 1860s during the Civil War. So when you see brick at Fort Niagara, that was not put there by the French, it was put there by uh, the US. If you have a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself. 
and go ahead and ask. Uh, why did they have the saint symbol on a few of those sloth things? <clears throat> why did they have the... If you go ahead and repeat that question. Logan, if you can go ahead and re repeat that question. Why did they have the saint symbol on the on a few of the sloths? Oh, you're talking about the fleur de lis. You're talking about the fleur de lis. Well, uh, the fleur de lis was sometime about I think the the ninth century. The French monarchy adopted that as their symbol. Uh, so when you saw a fleur de lis, it usually meant it was French. Well, here's a, here's a question. Um, why did the French build the bakehouse when they already had a boulangerie in the French castle? Well, and if you've been to the fort, you know that the little building that stands next to the castle is a bakehouse. Well, in the slideshow, we mentioned the war during the 1740s when Captain Pouchot was at Tournai, there was also a war here in North America called King George's War. And they were afraid, the French were afraid that Fort Niagara might be attacked. So they sent a lot of troops, maybe a hundred soldiers here to the fort. And there wasn't, and the boulangerie in the castle wasn't big enough to bake all the bread they needed to feed those, those men. So they built a new bakehouse outside uh, the castle so they could make more bread. All right. Um, um, how much of the, the castle today is original from the French, um, when the French built it? It is, um, the castle is considered a restoration rather than a reconstruction uh, because of the stone, the stone walls of course are original some, a lot of the woodwork had to be replaced uh, because over the years, the castle was modernized. The army was, the U.S. Army was billeting people in the castle into the 20th century. So um, a lot of those modern accretions had to be removed and the uh, 18th century windows and partitions and woodwork, some of the woodwork had to be replaced. So the stonework is original. And um, if you go in the castle and you look up at the beams on the ceilings, if they have little nail holes in them, chances are they're original beams as well. Some of the beams were bad and had to be replaced, so there are some new ones, but a lot of them are original, particularly on the west end of the building. So I think we're out of time. I thank you very much for your attention today. We're gonna be back on Thursday talking about the siege of Fort Niagara in 1759. Thanks for coming out and um, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So long. So long. Thank you.